This program is brought to you by Emory University. We're going to begin with uh, my distinguished friend and colleague and one of the great leaders of scholastic theological understanding, um, Gene Porter. Gene Porter, former president of the Society of Christian Ethics, one of the great scholars of the natural law in the high medieval period and its application and reconstruction for today, a wonderfully nimble teacher who has won all manner of awards for her work in the classroom and her work in commentary, uh, and whom we had the privilege to welcome here for a number of years as the McDonald Senior Fellow in Christian Jurisprudence, and had the opportunity to watch her develop from the ground up a powerful title, an award-winning title, Minister to the Law, a natural law theory of legal authority out a couple of years ago, available for you outside in the foyer. That book just stands as the apex of a whole long scholarly contribution that she has made in her long career. I mentioned a few other titles that she has, Nature as Reason, A Thomistic Theory of the Natural Law, Natural Law and Divine Law, Reclaiming the Tradition for Christian Ethics, Moral Action and Christian Ethics, The Recovery of Virtue, and scores of articles amplifying and embroidering uh, the powerful themes at work uh, in those seminal books. So it's a great privilege to welcome uh, Professor Porter back uh, to these hallowed halls, to have a chance to hear her reflecting uh, on a new um, vein of thought that she has begun to open for us in thinking through the scholastic contribution to human rights in the Western tradition. And it's with great pride and pleasure and a personal privilege to welcome Professor Jean Porter. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, John Whitty, uh, who is a valued colleague and friend of, of many years standing now for that very kind introduction. I'd like to thank him uh, for the invitation to participate in this wonderful symposium. Uh, I'd like to add my thanks to those who have expressed appreciation to Al McDonald, uh, whose sponsorship has made this event possible and who has contributed in so many ways to the work of so many of us. Uh, a special word of thanks to uh, those working with John to make this event hospitable for all of us. They have gone, in my case certainly, above and beyond the call of duty. And thanks to you all for your attention. Um, I, I almost feel like the Monty Python skit, now for something completely different. Uh, <laughs> because having had a, a wonderful morning of reflection on the idea of human rights uh, and their place in contemporary theological and social discourse, I'm going to take us back rather abruptly, as John sort of warned you, uh, to the scholastic period, and in fact, I'm going to be focusing today on one particular reading of one particular author, who, however, stands at a pivotal point, both in terms of his own work, but also then in terms of the way in which he is, you should pardon the expression, remembered and retold, and cast in certain terms in the historiography of the development of rights discourse. That person, as uh, well, not surprise too many of you is Thomas Aquinas, uh, and I want to focus my view, my, my remarks this afternoon on the question of whether Thomas Aquinas has a theory of subjective rights. I'm going to focus on Aquinas uh, for almost my entire 25 and three quarters minutes. Um, I'm timing this very carefully. Uh, but I do, if time permits, hope to say a word or two about the broader implications of this. Um, or if that's not possible, perhaps I'll have a chance uh, to engage some of you on that later in the conversation. And so I began. Aquinas, citing a familiar text from Justinian, defines justice as a constant and perpetual will, rendering to each his right, use suum unicuique. Correlatively, the object of the virtue of justice is use, which can be understood in terms of a right state of affairs or an action directed towards rendering his or her right to another. To a contemporary, this claim might suggest uh, to, the, uh, to the mythical naive reader that Aquinas associates justice with natural or human rights. 
And as a matter of fact, that is what I'm going to argue. And yet, until recently, this whole line of interpretation would have been ruled out of court because scholars of the period and political theorists generally agreed that ancient and medieval authors had no doctrine of subjective rights, that for them the right is always understood in terms of what is objectively just, implying an impersonal moral order within which each person equally benefits from the moral duties incumbent on all. And so the moral world envisioned would, would look somewhat like the moral world envisioned by Simone Weil, as, as Stanley Hauerwas was sketching it this morning. The modern idea of natural or human rights, in contrast, identifies rights claims with some kind of authority or power inherent in the individual herself, through which she can legitimately claim some kind of forbearance or assistance from another. If this is generally accurate as a picture of the historical development of the doctrine of rights, then of course it would be anachronistic uh, to look for a doctrine of subjective rights in Aquinas. Now, more recently, one key element in this overall account was challenged by the seminal work of Brian Tierney and Charles Reed, uh, the latter an active participant in some of the events of the Emory Center in the past, who argue that claims to subjective natural rights are in fact asserted, defended, and even given legal recognition by canon lawyers as early as the mid-13th century. These jurists do not develop systematic theories of natural rights, nor do they extend rights claims to every domain of moral thought or legal practice. Nonetheless, it seems clear that by Aquinas' time, that is to say the mid to late 13th century, we do have jurists defending subjective natural rights in some key contexts. And yet almost no one, including Tierney, extends this revisionist line to Aquinas himself. On the contrary, we still have a general agreement among historians, Thomists, and political theorists to the, along the general lines that for Aquinas, the use or the right ought to be understood in older terms as a just state of affairs constituted by an objective moral order. In this brief paper, I will argue that this way of reading Aquinas is wrong, or at best seriously misreading, misleading. It is true that Aquinas identifies the use or the right with relations of justice obtaining between parties to an equitable exchange. And in this sense, he identifies the right with an objective state of affairs. This is simply tantamount to saying he is a moral realist, and I don't think anyone seriously questions that. But Aquinas' comprehensive account of the object of justice does not commit him to any particular construal of what constitutes a just relation. In particular, it does not keep him from holding that at least in some situations, the right understood as an objectively equitable relation presupposes that someone's claim of a right or someone's claim by right is duly acknowledged. What is more, Aquinas does in fact identify specific powers which individuals can claim by natural right in much the same terms as the canonists use. In short, if the canon lawyers whom Tierney and Reed study can be, can be said to have a theory or an idea of natural rights, then the same is true of Aquinas by the same argument. Now, the question of what Aquinas or the jurist or any other medieval author would mean by right is complicated by the fact that we're not real clear on exactly what we mean by, by, having, by having or possessing or exercising a right. In general, however, those who defend doctrines of natural or human rights today would argue that the right is a subjective moral power of the individual in terms of which he can claim the performance of some duty or claim some immunity from some specific agent or class of agents. It's critical here that on this view, the idea of a subjective right presupposes more than simply a moral claim which in some way attaches to an individual. It implies that the individual is properly an active agent in asserting the claim, and the claim sets up a duty uh, a, a corresponding duty on someone else's part. And so it is a moral normative power. As such, rights claims introduce distinctive normative claims over and above reciprocal general duties. 
What is more, natural or human rights are said to be grounded in some aspect of shared humanity, most generally in the capacity for free action. Thus, rights claims are said to be universally valid and binding and not dependent on specific social arrangements or cultural values, or at least, as some would say, not all the way down. Tyranny's revisionist history of rights depends on showing that by the 13th century, some jurists do defend individuals' claims to natural rights in terms essentially similar to those I've just outlined. We tend to overlook these claims because the, the canonists are not giving us systematic theories of rights. Rather, their concept of natural rights emerges within a context of judicial practice, and it reflects processes of reflection on and official recognition of pre-conventional bases for claims upon others. Thus, the clearest indications of the scholastic jurist views on rights claims can be found unsurprisingly in the legal practices they defend and the innovations they support. While they do not offer theories of natural rights, they do defend individuals' claims to rights which are there by nature, and this assertion of rights claims is a logical extension of practices already in place in both civil and ecclesiastical contexts for safeguarding individual freedom. As Tierney and others observe, Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries was a remarkably litigious society. Men and women at every level of society laid claims to rights of all kinds on whatever basis in whatever courts would give them a hearing. Initially, these claims seem to have been justified by prior agreements or historical grants of privilege or immunity or some enactment of human or divine law. However, scholastic jurisprudence was familiar with an alternative tradition of right, according to which there is a natural right or a natural law which precedes and in some way supersedes human agreements and enactments. In its earlier classical forms, as we would find, for example, in the Roman jurists or the Stoics, this natural right was not identified with subjective rights in our sense. Rather, it was associated with immutable legal or moral principles. For the scholastic jurists and theologians, in contrast, natural right or natural law is associated most fundamentally with the individual's capacities for moral discernment, are with the fundamental first principles which provide the starting points for such discernment. Natural right thus understood is a kind of individual capacity or power, integrally connected to the human person's freedom and her standing as a responsible moral agent. This conception of natural right does not necessarily imply a belief in rights as subjective powers, but we can see how within the scholastic context it would at least suggest such a view. As Tierney remarks, once the term use naturale, natural right, was clearly defined in this subjective sense, the argument could easily move in either direction to specify natural laws that had to be obeyed or natural rights that could licitly be exercised. And canonistic arguments soon did move in both directions. Stoic reflection on natural right never led to a doctrine of natural rights. Canon law reflection did so, and quickly. Natural rights thus understood are claims to some kind of performance which are grounded in natural, that is to say, pre-conventional aspects of human life. These kinds of claims might have been construed in such a way as to identify them without remainder with the duties inherent in a moral order, but Tierney's point is that the close association between the general concept of right and notions of freedom and power led the canon lawyers of the time to construe these claims at least sometimes as individual freedoms or powers. Thus understood, someone who claims a right exercises a discretionary claim to enjoin or forbid certain kinds of actions. Tierney, who did a lot of his work in medieval poor law, cites the example of those canon lawyers who say that a poor person who takes what is necessary to sustain life from the rich uses his own right, his own use. Uh, and Charles Reed has a fascinating and extended discussion of the way in which this general idea is, is incorporated into the jurisprudence and practice of marriage, getting right down to litigation over the use conjugale, uh, the right of marriage, which is the power to demand sexual intercourse and to have a judge back you up on it. 
Uh, so ne let it never be said that the scholastics are unfamiliar with rights, language, and intimate contexts. This is the context within which to ass ac assess the claim that Aquinas does not have a conception of subjective rights over and above the impersonal <laughs> duties constituting a moral order. It is true that he does identify the right in its most general sense with an objectively just state of affairs. But this way of construing the general conception of the right was held in common between him and the jurists and by scholastics generally. It is consistent with identifying respect for individual subjective claims as being among those relevant normative considerations setting the criteria for right relations. In the course of setting out his extended treatment of the right and the virtue of justice, Aquinas goes well beyond a general conception of the right in order to identify the normative criteria for justice in a wide range of paradigmatic cases. In the process of doing so, he draws freely on the same juridical conceptions that shape canonical jurisprudence. And this should not surprise us because Aquinas shares the same social context as the canonists, and while he does not have a lawyer's familiarity with courtroom procedures, he is clearly aware of the kinds of claims and justifications informing the legal practices of his own time. He has an intelligent layman's sense of how the law works, which informs his scholarly work, um, something that in my own modest way I would say of myself and I would say of many of my colleagues. You don't have to be a lawyer to know at least a little bit of law. More specifically, Aquinas is well aware that in certain contexts, the language of right is associated with a practice of making and justifying claims, and that I think is the critical point. Someone claims something by right, referring to the consideration which justifies him in claiming some immunity or some power. It is true that Aquinas does not generally refer to someone's right in possessive terms as the canonists do, except at one point. But that is a critically important point. That is, he claims that the object of the virtue of justice is to render to each his or her right. He goes on to spell out the bases for claims of right in terms of divisions between natural and positive right. Distinctions which ultimately trace back to Aristotle, but which by this point were clearly and firmly built into the jurisprudence and the legal practice of the time. For Aristotle himself, the categories of what is right by nature and what is right by convention are associated with generally applicable normative claims rather than individual powers. But by placing Aristotle's distinctions within the context of Justinian's definition, Aquinas at least suggests that the claims of right to which Aristotle refers ought to be understood as grounds for claims of individuals which remain to some extent within individual discretion. This is further reinforced by the fact that Aquinas goes on almost immediately to identify the actions of a judge as a paradigm for the virtue of justice itself. Now that's surprising. It, it's unusual in Aquinas' own time, and it's hard to imagine any contemporary writer on justice with the notable example of Ronald Dworkin who would try to make this kind of claim today. Uh, but for Aquinas, a good judge is the very paradigm of justice, and what does that tell us about how Aquinas is thinking of justice? Well, a judge is characteristically one who adjudicates among claims of individuals who are petitioning the court to uphold their right or to grant them immunity or redress from the improper claims or acts of another. Aquinas' focus on judicial paradigms does not imply that he limits claims of right to what can be adjudicated formally. I think he clearly does not. Nonetheless, at the very least, we can say that his intuitions about justice have been shaped by judicial contexts, and this opens up the possibility that he does have a conception of natural rights understood subjectively as grounded in some way in the moral powers of individuals. Yet even if Aquinas could have thought of claims of right in this way, do we have good textually grounded reasons for thinking that he does understand right in these terms? We have already noted that he does not generally speak in terms of someone's making use of his own right, but he does identify specific claims or immunities which individuals enjoy by virtue of natural right. In Aquinas' way of spinning the case that so many people discuss at this time, 
The poor individual who takes what is another's in order to meet immediate and urgent needs is not guilty of theft or robbery because the natural right to sustain oneself supersedes the conventional right to private property. And it is important here to remember that Aquinas does not think there is a natural right to individual private property, um, which I think makes the case more straightforward for him. Aquinas does not say that one who takes what is another's does so by virtue of her own right, but, she does say, but he does say that she does not act wrongfully, and the implication is that she is immune from punishment. Clearly, in this context, the collective natural right of use of material things granted to humanity as a whole provides a basis in some circumstances for an individual claim to exercise that natural right on her own behalf and at her own discretion. Similarly, Aquinas claims that a child of non-believers cannot be baptized against his parents' will because doing so would violate the natural right of parents to control their children's upbringing. Once again, a general natural right grounded in the right relation between parents and children can be claimed and exercised by individuals at their own discretion. In addition to these examples, we find a number of points at which Aquinas defends the legitimacy of a claim or an immunity by appealing to some aspect of shared human nature which justifies some kind of authoritative claim on the part of the individual. Thus, those who are accused of a crime are entitled to appropriate judicial procedures, and those who are convicted of crime remain immun retain immunities from harm for other private individuals in virtue of the claims of humanity which they hold in common with the rest of us. Someone can defend herself against attack, even by lethal force, because the natural orientation towards life justifies her in placing her own self-preservation over against the claims of the attacker. It is also worth noting that Aquinas places strict limits on the obligations of obedience, arguing that because we are all equal with respect to shared human nature, no one can compel obedience in matters pertaining to our natural life. Thus, no one can compel another either to marry or to refrain from marriage. And this, again, is a, is a theological and theoretical elaboration of a point that was generally recognized uh, in canon law. At some point, Aquinas formulates these claims in objective terms. For example, he frames claims to due process as we would describe them in terms of the duties of public officials and private individuals towards those accused of crimes. Yet it is difficult to believe that in this context, these particular duties would not be correlated with the claims of the accused, to be heard, to be immune from private vengeance and the like. At any rate, Aquinas clearly sees the individual's right to self-defense as a basis for a claim to act in a certain way and to be vindicated in the confessional or in a court of law. If someone cannot be compelled to marry or to refrain from marriage, then he can claim a freedom to marry or to refuse to marry. These certainly look an awful lot like subjective claims of rights in the full-bodied contemporary sense. What can we conclude? At the very least, we can say that Aquinas, together with many of his contemporaries, identifies a zone of autonomy within which men and women are free to act as they see fit, and he does so by appealing to considerations of natural right or to fundamental aspects of our shared nature. Aquinas thus goes beyond identifying a sphere of objective right, comprised of duties of respect and forbearance which are incumbent on all, but owed to no one in particular. He also holds that men and women can freely pursue uh, their aims and place claims on another for aid or forbearance by appealing to relevant aspects of our shared nature. All this implies that for Aquinas, an ideal of the excellence of human nature and the claims proper to it provides him with a framework within which to make sense of what we might describe as the practices of right. At one point, Aquinas remarks that someone who harms another in fundamental ways violates the excellence which each person has simply in view of the excellence of human nature itself. We are now in a better position to see what that means. For both Aquinas and his interlocutors, human nature itself confers a status on each man and woman. As the scholastics repeatedly say, quoting Roman sources, 
By nature, all are equal with respect to free status, and all possessions are held in common. As they go on to say, these things are changed by the law of nature, and they devote considerable efforts to explain how this is possible, given that natural right is supposedly immune to derogation or change. Aquinas' own way of dealing with this difficulty clearly indicated in the Secunda Secunde 66-7, but implied throughout his account, rests on the view that in fact natural right cannot be entirely abrogated by human law. Communal practices and human law provide a necessary framework within which men and women can formulate and exercise claims of natural right. Nonetheless, Aquinas insists that human right, grounded in human law or customary practice, cannot set these claims aside. On his view, natural right is expressed and qualified, but in no way abrogated by the law of nations or by human law. Natural right is grounded in equality of status and an equal claim to make use of material things, at least in necessities. More specifically, the fundamental equality enjoyed by all men and women is an equality of status as free and self-directed moral agents. All men and women are naturally free, and for Aquinas, this is not simply a matter of honorific status, but it has a practical impact. It implies that individuals ought to be free to act as they see fit in certain critical respects and to claim certain immunities and certain kinds of sustenance for themselves. The ideal of equality as Aquinas understands it is not limited to an equality with, the, with respect to right, since it also integrates broader considerations, but natural equality is centrally connected to claims of right, and equal regard as we would express the normative ideal is bound up with respect for the freedom of others. Now, I have about three minutes, and let me in that time just say very briefly what I think the moral implications of this are. I would call attention to two. First, I think that Aquinas and the other scholastics changed the vocabulary of rights in one critical way. That is, for them, the key moral concept is the claim that the individual is a locus of authority, morally and legally, who can, as such, make peremptory claims over against others. Limited, to be sure, but, but nonetheless real. The right, the use, reflects any kind of a principle which can justify an authoritative claim, whether made by the individual on his or her own behalf, or made by the legislator or the judge in legislating or acting for the common good. So what you have here is one fundamental concept of right which can be appropriated in two distinct but complementary and not reducible ways. The other point I think is worth underscoring is that for Aquinas, this is a central element of the moral order itself. It doesn't stand over against the moral order. For Aquinas and for his contemporaries, one of the fundamental assumptions about the value of individuals is that individuals as such do have a value which is non-negotiable, which cannot be superseded, and which individuals themselves can and ideally should play an active role in claiming and enjoying for themselves. And so moral value thus understood is not simply a matter of being a passive recipient of duties, but it is a matter of, at least when one's abilities and circumstances permit, also taking an active role in claiming one's own place in the moral world and expecting that bedrock of claims to be respected by others. Now, I myself think that is a very powerful vision. Um, I think it happens to be the right vision, and I, for one, would be very sorry to see us sacrifice it as we engage in necessary and needed reflections on the complexities of these issues. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.